Ladies first. Okay, we're back. It's four o'clock rock. And where are we? We're in Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Every Wednesday at four o'clock. Every you can you can set your clock. Okay, my co-host and former commissioner of the PUC and an active player in Hawaii Natural Energy Institute, John Cole. John S. Cole. E. Cole. John E. Cole. <laughs> Close. <laughs> Thanks, Jay. Today we're here again, the last Wednesday of the month. This month's been centered around UH and the University of Hawaii and what's going on with energy. And today we're going to talk about energy efficiency and some really cool structures that our guests work with. Um, we have Professor Olga Boric Lubecki, who is with the College of Engineering, and she's a professor of electrical engineering. And Jim Maskery, who's at HNEI, the same uh, institute that I work for, Hawaii Natural Energy Institute. Okay. Well, let's first let's talk about what HNEI is doing with the special zero energy classroom. Okay, Keska <laughs> Seikasa. That's French. <laughs> it means what is this zero energy classroom? So the the net, net zero, it's a net zero NZE uh, classroom. It's a these were designed to be highly energy efficient and to generate at least as much energy as they're going to use. So therefore, net net zero on an annualized basis. Um, this was a project that was funded originally by the Office of Naval Research, and it's uh, it's actually comprised of five different buildings. Um, one out in Eva Beach at Alima Intermediate, two over in Kauai, and they've been up and uh, uh, we've been monitoring for them for a couple of years. The, the final two of the five we just completed a couple of weeks ago at the uh, University of Hawaii Manoa are College they of Education. Are movable, these test structures? They are, um, technically, they're portable. But nobody they're likes temporary to carry structures. Them yeah. They're temporary structures, but uh, like most uh, of our temporary structures, they'll they'll be there for for quite a while. Okay. And, and the big question, of course, and I'm, I'm speaking for David Ige here, um, are they air conditioned? They are air conditioned. <laughs> <laughs> and that's actually one of the features. Was this the, the the air conditioning is somewhat of a specialized approach to air conditioning, where generally we default to an off condition. And then when they need it and want it, then they will push an override. It'll stay on for an hour. These are classrooms, multiple teachers. They have different uh, functions in each class, so they have different needs. So basically, rather than turn the air conditioner on at the beginning of the day and just leave it on all day and all night, it's basically push on button. demand. Push a button. Push a button, and it's, and it's on demand. You know, in the uh, in MIC, the Manoa Innovation Center, they have exactly that. Had it for a long time. And if you want air conditioning, you know, Push the button. It works very. It works very well. And then in, a, in addition, we've got very high efficient lighting, uh, ceiling fans to circulate the air to create the comfort in the classroom. So the, my question is, why? Why, Jim? Why are you doing this? What? Well, the university has a long-term goal of 100% renewable by 2035. Now, this is we're trying to demonstrate the technologies that we can actually build net zero buildings and stay comfortable at the same time. We've got, we look at the Department of Education and we see all these very, very uncomfortable classrooms. Looking very closely at why are these uncomfortable? Where now we're demonstrating we've got good practical solutions to comfort. They only need to rely on the air conditioning for you know, you know, a couple of months within the year. The rest will all depend on opening the windows natural ventilation, ceiling fans, and create a perfectly comfortable environment. <clears throat> okay, so I'll just make, I'll make a civilian guess here. Sure. The sun comes and beats on the solar panels. Yeah. The solar panels fill batteries. The button takes the, the juice out of the batteries and it puts it in the lights, the air conditioner, whatever else. Is that it? Is that, that that simple? We're getting we're getting close because what am I missing here? It it is it is your connected. turn is coming, Olga. <laughs> it is connected to the grid. It is connected to the grid. Oh, oh, okay. And but what we we will be as part of our research, and part of the intent of this to answer the question about why is it also gives us a platform for energy efficient research. So, uh, and that's where Olga will come in, but. Um, We'll be doing some battery testing and some uh, battery comparisons out there as well. So we will have batteries. We'll be simulating 
an off-grid condition, but we are connected to the grid. Okay. How far along are you in this project? We have completed the classrooms there in their first semester of occupancy, and it's kind of a shakedown quarter. As we, as uh, my team completes putting in the instrumentation and the sensors that, that we need to be able to monitor all of the energy. And there are students the or are people in the classroom? Yep. Yeah, from the real college students. of education. This is real, real time, real, real students. Real students, real students out okay. of college and of education. And you tell them what you're doing. Yeah? Absolutely. We've got posters <laughs> on the wall telling them this is how the building, these are the features of the building. This it. is, we're trying to instill a culture, we're trying to really, instill really. a culture within the school of uh, college of education. You know, he said sensors. I heard him say sensors just now. That's the magic word. Yep, absolutely. So at the College of Engineering, you're working on sensors. That's right. But you haven't always been working on sensors. There was a time you were working on radar, and that's when we met. We met when you were working on radar, you and your husband. That's correct. Uh, actually, we have been working on these sensors for a long time, oh, okay, but they're okay. radar-based sensors. Ah! So, so, yes. <laughs> it all comes together now, yeah. radar-based sensors. Exactly, yes. So actually, we are using Doppler radar technology that we originally developed for medical monitoring um, for energy efficiency purposes. Ah. So um, we are still looking for heartbeats and for respiration in the room, but we're not necessarily looking uh, for medical features. So we're now actually looking to decide if there is an occupant in the room or not. Okay. The, 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 stopping there just for a moment, you see what happens. You develop a technology for one use, and then you say, aha, we could use it for something else. I, you know, I think Thomas Edison did things like that. Yeah. Well, it's kind of like, you know, we have a hammer, so we're looking for a nail, right? But, th <laughs> but, but this is a good fit because uh, um, energy efficiency is such an important it area. Is. And um, there is a need for the sensors that can detect people when they're not moving. Because mm -hmm. the um, limitations, the main limitation of the current technology is if you're just sitting at your computer and typing or reading, um, they will think that you're not there. So what may happen in an office environment, the lights may turn off while you're actually in your office, and then you may need to get up and wave your arms and walk around a little bit, which may not necessarily be a bad thing, right? You would be getting a little bit yeah, of exercise. You should, you should stand up once an hour anyway. You should stand up once an hour anyway, right? But people do get annoyed, so it is, yeah. um, it is a nuisance. And um, what happens is they essentially disable the sensors because they don't like them, or they, oh. uh, yeah. So, so can we can we go back to the the story about the hotel rooms in in Europe compared to the U.S. compared to Asia? Yes. Because I just came back from Europe. Yes. And I, I was charmed as I always am with putting my hotel key card uh, in a little slot as I walked in the door of the hotel room and then turn everything on, and nothing would go on until I did that. And then on the way out, in order to, you know, leave, I had to take this out of the, the little slot, and that was my, my key again, and that's how I left. I was charming. That was so totally efficient. But it doesn't work, right? Well, it doesn't always work because if you have multiple cards, you can override the system, right? So you can leave one card in the room and let the AC um, leave it running and uh, walk out with another card. So this and this is, cost a hotel some money. And this cost a hotel a lot of money. So and actually, typically in hotel rooms, um, energy bills are pretty high. I mean, energy consumption is high compared to residential. Like when people go um, on vacation, um, and especially if they're paying for you know, a relatively expensive hotel room, they really don't want to worry about if, if they turn uh, their leave AC the TV on, right, leave everything, leave everything on. on yeah, right, yeah, yeah. and it is kind of part of their bill, right? They're not going to be charged separately. So the yeah. same sort of thing happens in dorms um, and also with classrooms. You know, if the users of the space are not responsible for their electric bill, they don't have a lot of motivation to worry about how is that energy okay. used. I can go to Simply Safe, a, 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 a security company, and for $6, uh, maybe 15, whatever, something in there, I can buy a sensor that will spot anybody walking around this room here. If it's on, it's okay. always going to spot. <laughs> what do you bring to that table that's beyond my $6 sensor from Simply Safe. Right. Six dollar sensors are hard to beat, but uh, the key is you said that <laughs> the sensor can detect anyone walking in the room. So if there is a large motion, if you have somebody opening the door and walking in, the sensors will pick them up. The problem is what happens when the person stops moving. So essentially our technology um, most likely would be used in conjunction with the technology that you mentioned. 
right? So as a baseline, true technology right? So as a baseline, you can use the sensor that you mentioned, which is most likely a passive infrared sensor that would essentially detect when people walk into the room. But then once there is no signal coming out of those sensors, we would check to see is that really true or not. Okay, then we're back to the the radar reading yes. my respiration and pulse and what have you. Yes, exactly. Suppose my pulse is slow, can you still read it? <laughs> yes. Well, we can actually tell people from different sources of motion. So, for example, if you have a fan in the room, and um, there are several of those in the, um, in the classrooms, uh, we can differentiate the fan from the person because the, you know, the patterns of your heart and respiration are very different uh, from the mechanical motion. Or, for example, you may have a curtain blowing in the wind, or you may have you know, air movement uh, due to the um, AC system. We can di differentiate those kind of motions from okay. human motions because human motions have very unique signatures. See that picture? Yes. That's my baby. She oh. weighs four pounds. She's a Yorkshire Terrier. Can you get this picture? <laughs> That's my baby, Emily Kaea. So we, we can tell Kaea. the difference between her and... That's my uh, question. Yes, yes. Yes. So she, she would not register on your radar. Well, she could get by. No, not we necessarily. Pick we no. can pick up geckos and cats and, and dogs. But, you know, the thing is, um, they all look different. Yeah. So depending on how complicated the so you processing can set it. is. You can set it to a four-pounder, a 20-pounder, a 30-pounder. Well, you see that dog is going to have different heart and respiration patterns <laughs> well, than, than a human being, right? So you can <laughs> look for different patterns, right? Or you can just say, look only for human patterns, so depending on which space you're monitoring. So where in the College of Engineering does this kind of science fit? Uh, you're electrical engineering? Electrical, yes. Okay. All these things you described are electrical engineering. Yes. Okay. So, and you've worked um, on this for some time because you were working on the, uh, the Afghanistan issue, trying to find people <coughs> behind the wall. Yes. So now this is easy. Now, how does this connect with Jim's zero energy room? Right. Well, the, um, actually, the classrooms that, that um, Jim built are um, a fantastic opportunity for us. They are essentially a research platform. So we can um, use them to test the accuracy of our sensors. So our sensors uh, this is, are still in research, right? So we still need to prove that they can do better than the commercial sensors. Mm -hmm. We actually are pretty certain that they can. But when we um, present our data, normally our audience likes to see how do they compare uh, with the commercially available sensors in realistic environments. So this is an environment that's very energy efficient. It already has commercial off-the-shelf sensors um, in use. And um, essentially, we would use these, these um, uh, research platforms to test the performance of our sensor against the performance of the sensors that they're already used. Uh, um, I don't know why, but I'm having a flash on one of those Tom Cruise movies where he wants to steal some diamonds or something, lowers himself down to the case where the diamonds are and the sensors don't pick them up because he's just above the line of the sensors. Can you cover the whole room, including the part, you know, where you lower yourself down from the ceiling? Well, you certainly can. I mean, you, you know, you have to know what the room is, right? What is the shape and the size of the room? And then you can design your sensors to cover the so whole area. So, yes. again, it's a software thing? Um, well, it's software and hardware, right? So okay. you have to place the, s the sensor in strategic locations. Isn't that great to be an engineer? <laughs> yes. uh, you know, I should have gone that road. Yeah. Back it can one. go through the walls, right? It be engineer. Well, it can go through the walls. So, I mean, in, if you're talking about <coughs> hotel rooms, you actually don't want to go through the wall, right? You just want to um, test um, yeah. that room, that yeah. particular room. You can adjust room. it for that. Point. But you can actually, you can build the sensors so that it actually senses through the wall. So, it, you know, you, you use different combinations of your antenna app and the frequency, um, radar frequency, and the power that you're sending. So you can actually tweak it for different space or different types of wall materials and that sort of thing. Now, we heard Jim talk about this one-hour button push, okay? And then we heard you, Olga, talking about how, this, how the sensor would look in the room and tell us was anybody there, even if he was really quiet or, or small, four pounds. Um, and when we come back from this break, I want to ask you a very important question. Does your technology replace his technology? Don't answer. <laughs> Are you going to eclipse what Jim is doing in the push button? We'll be right back after this break and find out the answer. Right. Please join us at Think Tech Hawaii. My program is Asia in Review. And my next program is on November 17, Thursday, 11 a.m. This is Johnson Choi, your host. 
Looking to energize your Friday afternoon? Tune in to Stay in the Energy Man at 12 noon. Aloha Friday here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. Every Friday afternoon at 2 p.m., you'll have a chance to come and listen and learn from scientists around the world. Scientists who talk about their work in meaningful, easy to understand ways. And you'll come to appreciate science as a wonderful way of thinking, way of knowing about the world. You'll learn interesting facts, interesting ideas. You'll be stimulated to think more. Please come join us every Friday afternoon at 2 p.m. here on Think Tech Hawaii for a likable science with me, your host, Ethan Allen. Hello, ha, how you doing? It's me, Angus McTech, wishing you to welcome and join us to see us on Hibachi Talk on Think Tech Hawaii. Join my co-hosts, Gordo the Tech Czar and Andrew the Security Guy every Friday from 1300 to 1345. We look forward to seeing you. We'll talk tech and we'll have some wee bit of fun. And remember, let your wing gang free wherever you be. Hello. Ha. We're back. <laughs> Hi, John. That's John E. Cole over there. Hello, John. <laughs> and next to him, uh, Jim Masqui, uh, also of the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute. Uh, next to him, uh, Dr. Olga Borek Becky. Uh, who is a professor of electrical engineering at the College of Engineering at UH Manoa. So we, we are left hanging with this question. And uh, who, which of you wants to answer my question as to whether uh, Olga's technology is going to replace your push button uh, 18th century technology, where you turn everything on and off with a switch with a button? Let me, let me take a stab at that. Because one, one of the things that we're trying to accomplish with our net zero building is to create a a culture, you know, to create some interaction between the user and their environmental conditions. Um, let them determine whether they are actually comfortable or not comfortable. And, uh, and so giving them the ability to be able to turn off or turn on manually, um, while it seems very archaic, it's actually very efficient. Power to the people. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, it's tough enough that we give them occupancy sensors that turn the lights on and raise the lights um, up and dim them when there's plenty of daylight. So there's nothing they can do with the lights other than turn them off. Um, the ceiling fans aren't too much fun to vary the speed on. And, and uh, so the only thing left is the mechanical system for them to, okay. to play with. Okay, so, so you would leave the push button in place because it, it's that sense of empowerment? Well, f from a re research perspective, yes. As we, as we study this for the next couple of years to try to determine a baseline of behavior, then we'll, we'll watch to determine whether, are they turning it on during times when it's completely comfortable without the air conditioning, um, just because it's there? Or are they turning it on only when the conditions are such that it really requires? Air okay, I think I got it. It's the watchbird watching you. Your technology is watching his technology. Um, well, something like that. I think our technology can help to improve the conditions a little bit. And, okay. and how would it work? How would it integrate with the push button? Well, I think if you um, have people that left the room, right, and the room is empty, and they didn't push the button, right? Then our technology would essentially push would the button. override yes. the push button. Yes, right. So essentially the goal is to avoid um, waste of energy when the space is empty. But it wouldn't work the other way. In other words, if we came into the room and it needed energy, your technology is not going to push the button for the people in the room. They still have to push the button old-fashioned style. We could, we could, could but could. I think the way that the space is configured now. The way it's configured and actually right? in, in energy efficiency uh, design, in fact, in California, they're even requiring what you just suggested, which are called vacancy sensors, as opposed to an occupancy sensor. A vacancy sensor will turn off when somebody leaves the room, but it has to be manually started up. Uh -huh. So it, there has to be a conscious decision made to start a device you as could a, do that with as this opposed technology. to automatic yeah so so her device would be able to close close it out at the end of the day um, with very high uh, uh, sensitivity towards whether anybody's in there or not but starting it up would be 
and still manual. So you're, you're the closing out technology rather than the starting up technology. An accurate closing yeah, yes. out. Accurate. <laughs> well, I guess the bottom line is what you want to avoid the waste, right? So like Jim mentioned, what we are really looking at is this vacancy sensor, right? Okay. So making sure that if you, spa if you have space that's not unoccupied, we do not waste We know energy. that for sure. That yeah. is really unoccupied. Yeah, yeah. And on the other hand, we do not want to turn off the lights if people are there. Right, yeah. because it's not only a comfort issue, it's, it's also a safety issue. Okay, now suppose I'm a student in, in the uh, laboratory classroom, the special mm -hmm. net zero classroom, mm -hmm. and I leave, and I'm the last one out the door. Mm -hmm. And as I walk out the door, I realize, and, and it's closed down now, the lights are off, the energy is off, we are reaching efficiency by not providing energy to a, uh, a classroom in which nobody is present. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As I walk out the door, I say, oh, whoops, I forgot my cell phone, or I forgot my pencil, or I forgot my notebook, and the like. So I come back in. What happens? <laughs> Nothing. Yeah. Well, usually, actually, the sensors are set with some delay, right? So usually they're going to give you some grace period of maybe five minutes or, or oh, ten that much. minutes or okay. something okay. like that, right? Okay. So that's actually something that... Uh, can be adjusted, right? But if you go home and you remember that you forgot something yeah. and you come back a couple hours up, later, yeah. right, you would have to push, a button. Uh, push the okay. button. And that, and, that, and that really depends on what device um, is set to it. Yes. Occupancy sensing or vacancy sensing? Okay, so here we have the classrooms are built. The buttons are in. I'm, you, the, the appliances are in, whatever they are, you know. And we're ready to go. And Olga's working on this thing, but it's not done. So you haven't installed. What is your what is your path in terms of developing this device, installing it, and implementing it? We are actually working on um, they're plans in the rooms? for installation. No, they are not in the rooms now. But um, as the buildings were um, worked on, we actually um, uh, talked to Jim about the possibility of this testing. So uh, Jim actually provided a, a platform for us. Um, so the building is pretty much ready so we've pre -wired. Um, for, yeah it pre -wired is pre-wired for, for so all you gotta yeah. do is put it in yep. yeah okay and so it'll, it'll just be that it'll be a vacancy kind of thing if there's nobody there it'll turn it off with a grace period of whatever to be determined right, right. well in initially we will use it uh, to assess the accuracy of, of um, our sensor compared to the sensors that are there so initially we're not going to control anything in the room with our sensors right? I'd love to be one of your Yes. One of your test test model people. What I'll do is I'll sit at the desk like this, not move a muscle. <laughs> <laughs> Try to lower my heart rate and see if you still pick me up. Yeah, absolutely. No, we'd love to <laughs> test you. We can come here and test you during your show, too. <laughs> and so, you guess so you can see if, uh, how they feel about um, the questions they're being asked. Right? So, John, <clears throat> how does this relate to HNEI's mission? Well, our main mission is to reduce the state's dependency on fossil fuels, and efficiency is the most cost-effective way to go about that. And there's so much opportunity, I think, with the efficiency that hasn't even been tapped into. I mean, this stuff is very high-tech and automated, and, and as we get that way, you know, more and more, the better. But one of the things I've seen is, you know, you can install a lot of e energy efficiency measures and appliances and things like that but if the people using the buildings or, or appliances or whatever aren't educated or don't know enough about it it's, it kind of goes to waste so it comes with an education and behavior change process I so think that's really tell important the students too. what you're doing yeah, yeah. and uh, Jim was mentioning that you know different people might have different comfort levels so they have ways of getting input from the students and others that use the buildings as to whether they were comfortable that day or not. Oh, you survey the students. That's right. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. What do you ask them? So we're developing a, a, a sort of an informal polling device, electronic polling device, where we would basically ask a fundamental question, how comfortable were you? And give them a choice. Very comfortable, slightly uncomfortable, uh, slightly uncomfortable, and very whatever, uncomfortable, yeah. whatever the scale is. Yeah. And, uh, and then just collect their responses and compare them to the actual environmental conditions within the temperature the humidity what we're observing within the space and then try to do a correlation between their their perception of comfort and the actual conditions so a lot of a lot of the 
one aspect of the area of work that we're doing is really tied to behavior and perception. Yeah. Well, and perception it, is really everything. It's everything. It. And if you know that a certain set of parameters is comfortable for, you know, say, 90% of them, that's what you want to achieve right there. That's right. That's yeah. right. And we'll, we'll have hard data on how, how warm is it in there. With ceiling fans, actually, you can actually have a fairly high temperature in there with the air motion moving across the skin um, and feel very comfortable. So we'll be able to actually document that. This is an architect's dream, isn't it? He's an architect, by the way. I'm sorry I revealed that. You can still talk to me. Okay. <laughs> I promise. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, you know, you want to make people comfortable in their house. That's Absolutely. what you want to do more than anything. We want to create comfort at, at a low cost for energy. Yeah. yeah. So, I'll give you a hypothetical. Okay. Olga has finished all her research and testing. And she has installed in the classrooms, all of them, um, you know, these devices. And you have finished your survey work and you've correlated, you know, the answers with the maximum, you know, uh, not only the maximum comfort, but the maximum efficiency that you could achieve, right? And HNEI has a record of all this. You know, it has, it has all these lessons are written down and we have a book that thick on exactly what we have learned in all this and what we have used to achieve what outcomes. How are you going to deliver that technology to me in my house? Can I buy it? I have my checkbook. Can I buy it? Can I incorporate that? Can I be as comfortable as your students? I want to be as comfortable as your students. When and how can I achieve that? I think Olga and I would have two different answers because she will have a commercial market. Our, our audience is really, <laughs> is, is, is you know, the, the energy efficiency research industry, if you will. <laughs> it's, and we're, we're trying to contribute to the body of knowledge towards um, the design of energy efficient buildings. It's not so much directed to the consumer, but then it's up to others to be able to integrate those responses and that work. So you publish. Designs. So we're publishing. And other yeah. architects of like mind pick that up, and before you know it, it's in this house and that house and this house. Correct. And that house. Exactly. So exactly. <clears throat> you have to come back and tell us more as this goes goes by, because then we can tell people how it works. Same thing for you, Olga. Olga, what is your answer to my question? By the well, way? we are actually commercializing this technology. So through the um, what office does that of mean? the that mean uh, patents. That, is that, what that it means? means patents. That means a startup. Um, and we actually started several years ago. And we are working with the tech transfer office at UH. Uh, we also worked with the um, UH accelerator. Um, so we have been fortunate to have received some funding um, to actually take our research to the prototype stage, and that is actually going to help us with this uh, further testing of the. Um, at zero, zero oh, sure, buildings, sure. Yeah. This is all. Is it the same company that you were using for the radar back when, or a different no, company? No, no, different, different, com different product. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. How interesting. Okay. So then, you know, assuming you know you, you you have your venture capital and and you have your patents. It takes five years to get a patent. Um, <clears throat> what then? I mean, you're gonna you're gonna go in the market in Walmart. I mean, can I find it on the store there? Can I bring it back to my house? And is that what you're designing? Well, we are actually seeking the partnership uh, with uh, one of the large uh, manufacturers of um, these kind of technologies and with energy integrators. So uh, we are, I think we would be too small to really make it to the Walmart shelf. Um, so I think uh, coming to market would be, um, you know, more realistic uh, path for us would be a partnership. Okay, Kmart. Oh, oh, no, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it would be an object, right? Yes. It would, and it would, I'd plug yes. it into my house. It would live between the power source and the appliances. Yeah. Yes, well, it could be, it could be um, a sensor that you can plug into a wall anywhere. And um, it would essentially just look for where you are and then communicate with the power system in your house. Adjustable. Yeah. I could, all those parameters you were describing, I could change that. You could change them, right? So we would, I, I think we would most likely preset them to yeah. some level that yeah. most consumers would be happy with, yeah. And I could do that on my iPhone, right? Yeah, yes. Yeah. I think I just revealed something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or maybe I...